and welcome to the Balance Point. Today we are continuing the Gospel of Luke, <clears throat> chapter um, 1. So turn with me in your Bibles, chapter 1, picking up in verse 5. Luke chapter 1, 5. Before we begin, let us bow our hearts with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, come before and we give you praise, honor. We magnify you because you are not a God who is like the divine watchmaker, who simply sets the world up, spins it up, and leaves us to our own devices. But rather, Father God, you are a God who is intimately involved with your creation. You did not simply speak the words and the universe came into But at one point in creation, you molded the dust of the ground for man. And when we were so far gone that we could not help ourselves, you took on the form of man, became a child, and lived among us, might say. Thank you, Father God, for the grace that you have given us. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Yes, today we are continuing our study in the Gospel of I'm going to be picking up in verse 5. And uh, hopefully today we will down to about verse 17. But we how that is. Verse 5 of the chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth, Aaron, and they were both well advanced. I want to take a moment and just stop here and pick apart just this little section. Just this little section we're going to pick apart. Beginning in verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, what can we say about this? Well, we can say one thing about this. God is specific in his timing for everything that he does. You know, later in the Bible, we read the verse that in the fullness of time, God sent his only son. Well, in the fullness of time, God does what needs to be done. And that's a wonderful thing about the God that we serve, is that in the fullness of time, in the days of Herod, a specific time, that's crazy to think that God had a specific time in mind for when he would bring about the birth of his son. And that is awesome. Consider that God would do that. God would do that. So in the days of King Herod of Judea, <clears throat> a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, the second thing that we say here is that God 
as the right person in mind is will. God has the right person. And quite often, the person that God picks is not the smartest, is not the strongest, is not the fastest, not the most powerful. Watch this. In the days of Herod, God could have picked Herod for this task. But God did not pick Herod. Herod was a Roman appointee. He had lobbied in Rome to get this title, King of Judea. No, God picked a certain priest. And here's what's interesting about this priest that God picked. <clears throat> God did not pick the high priest or even necessarily any one of the high priest family. God just picked a priest, Zacharias. Now, Zacharias was of the division of Abijah. Here's the deal. If you go and you read about the divisions that were set up for the priests, um, back in Nehemiah, chapter 12. Uh, Nehemiah, chapter 12. And uh, these were the priests that came back from the captivity with, with Nehemiah. And I want you to notice where Abijah falls in this list. And then came up Zerubbabel, son of Shittiel, and Jeshua, Shariah, Jeremiah, Ezriah, Ezra, Amariah, Maluk, Atush, Shechaniah, Ahihum, Meramoth, Edo, uh, Gimathoya, Abijah. Now, this is not the same Abijah. To get to the courses of Abijah, we need to actually go back to, oop, we need to actually go back to, um, oh, where are we? I lost my reference. That's not a good thing. We need to go back to when David set up the course of the priests. And there were 14 courses. And this is found in, uh, in Samuel. There are 14 courses that David set up. And here's the thing. The course of Abijah was not the first course. Now, if it was the first course, you'd be like, cool, this is a priest of, of the oldest child and that's that's a place of honor of course we also know from our, our studies through the word that quite often God picks the last child you know during the time of Jacob and Jacob's 12 sons the last child Benjamin received a double portion the double portion was normally set aside for the firstborn child. So if this course of Abijah had been the last course, we go, cool, double portion. However, that is not course. That is not where the course of Abijah falls. The course of Abijah is not the first nor the last but instead it falls right smack in the middle. was the horse. And we can take from this the comfort that no matter where we are, no matter how insignificant, no matter how humble, no matter how unnoticeable, unremarkable, God notices. So watch this. 
Zacharias, unremarkable priest. And his wife was Elizabeth, and she was of the daughters of Aaron. So she too was of priestly life. Now, it would appear that God is beginning to set up church folk. But when we get in to chapter 2 and beyond, where we actually read about this child that's about to be announced to this couple, we're going to find out that this is a very non-traditional child. Even though he comes from a family of priests, he comes from a family of preachers, a descendant of preachers. He's going to be very non-traditional. And we can take from this that God loves to use people in unexpected ways. He will take us out of the place where we have been comfortable, the place where we have been groomed, and he will use us in unexpected ways. This is he's about to use Zacharias and Elizabeth. I want to pick up in verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. I want us to take special notice of this because of the four gospel writers, Luke is the only gospel writer to point out the righteousness of Zacharias. And this becomes particularly significant when you consider that of the four gospel writers, Luke is the only Gentile. When you consider that of the four gospels, when you consider that the, uh, the, the of the four Gospels, Luke's Gospel is the only Gospel that is written to the Gentiles. This is remarkable because the Gentiles really wouldn't care one whit about whether this couple was blameless with regards to the law of Moses. John, who writes to unbelieving Jews, doesn't mention this. Mark, who writes to Galilean, which would have been Jewish believers, doesn't mention this. Matthew, who writes to Jewish believers in general, doesn't mention this. But Luke, Luke points this out to us. And this is of hope to us because it shows that we as believers, we as believers should be careful to do the things that are pleasing to God. It is interesting because during this time of Zacharias and Elizabeth, you not only had the law of Moses, but you had the laws of elders, which were traditions of men. And quite often the traditions of men were used to supersede and to nullify the law of God. And yet we have this couple Whom Luke points out the blameless before the Lord. The blameless. And that's important to us because in this time that we live in where we are encouraged and cajoled and sometimes even coerced into following the 
the ideas and the traditions of man. And by the way, not all of human traditions are bad. But there comes a point where we need to take a stand and stand for ordinance of God. Now, I'm not suggesting that we get into law-keeping. Because at the end of the day, there are only two laws that we as believers, as Christ followers, should be following. First one being, love God with everything you got. And the second being, love your neighbor as yourself. And all of the rest of the laws and the prophets that we see in the Old Testament are simply commentary and examples of how we're to love God and love our neighbor. And so, this couple is noted for their righteousness before God. They were also noted for one other thing. Seven. But they had no child because Elizabeth had no child. In that day and age, your worth was determined by how many kids did you have? And in particular, how many sons did you have? Because your sons were your social security. Your sons were your support when you became old. And so to be older and not have children was considered to be a curse or a judgment from God. And so imagine this couple, this priestly couple, righteous before God. And yet, because of not having children, they would be considered, they would be looked down upon, almost as sinners. And the question would be, well, what sin caused them not to have children? And the lesson here that we need to take away from this is simply this. It doesn't matter what people see on the outside. What matters is what God sees. It doesn't matter what people see when you're out on the sidewalk. What matters is what does God see when you are alone in the bathroom looking in the mirror? Because you see, the people on the outside would have declared them sinners. Because they didn't have the outward appearance of God's blessing through the fruit of the womb. God saw their heart. And God has commented upon their heart. They were righteous and blameless. And watch this. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they both were well advanced in years. I'm going to come back to the second half of this verse because some explanation is going to be needed, and it comes in the next couple of verses. Verse 8. So it was that while he was serving as a priest before God, in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, His lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of God. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. I needed to comment on the second half of verse 7. And they were both well advanced in years. Now, to our minds, here in the 21st century, when I think of somebody as well advanced in years... I don't know about you guys, but because of my family background and because of what I've seen of my in-laws, I don't consider you well advanced in years to you about 90. Okay? 
if you if you anything less than 80 my eyes you, you still got it good to go 90 oh, we're beginning to push something there and so it's easy to interpret Zacharias and Elizabeth as being really old except for one for one thing they couldn't have been that old because of verse 8 so it was while he was serving as priest before the Lord in the order of his division this is an important thing because this verse along with the passage in Numbers Numbers 8 verses 24 through 28 Numbers 8 Verses 24 through 28. This passage in Numbers puts an upper limit on how old Zacharias could have been. Numbers 8, 24 through, I'm sorry, I misread. 24 through 26. There is no verse 28. Watch this. This is what pertains to the Levites. From 25 years old and above, one may enter to perform service in the work of the tabernacle of meeting. At the age of 50 years, they must cease performing this work and shall work no more. They may minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to needs. But they themselves shall do no work. In other words, at the age of 50, the Levites went into what, what we would call a semi-retirement. And as the older Levites, 50 and older, they would become more advisors to the younger Levites. And so that tells me that Zacharias, yeah, he may have been up there. And by the way, during that time, if you lived to be 50, dude, you were considered pretty old. But this puts an upper limit on how old Zacharias was, and that upper limit is 50 years old. And there is a other lesson. Man, these verses just have a lot in there for us. And it is simple. One's status in life, one's outward appearance. Remember the verse that they were both well advanced in years. If you happen to be a King James reader, that verse will say, and they were well stricken with age. The point here being, though you might look old on the outside, when God is ready to use you, Age doesn't matter. Think back to Moses. How old was Moses when he first began to lead the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt? He didn't start leading the children out of Egypt until he was 80 years old. He spent the first 40 years of his life being known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter raised in the palace. It was assumed that he would end up inheriting the throne of Egypt. And then some things went a little sideways, and he found himself on the backside of the desert at the age of 40. See, from birth to 40, he learned all the ways of Egypt, and he was wise in the ways of Egypt. At 40... God takes him to the backside of the desert to teach Moses how to be wise in the ways of the Lord, namely in the ways. Of and so Moses doesn't begin to serve until he was 80. Which, by the way, Moses was the youngest of the children. How old was Aaron when God had Moses to anoint him as high priest? 
he was older than Moses. Moses was 80. How old was Miriam? Remember, Miriam was Moses' older sister. I don't know, but Moses was over 80. The point being that while man might look at the outside, just like man looked at, you know, Zacharias and Elizabeth and went, wow, you know, what's sin caused you not to be able to have kids? They might look at the outside. I looked at the inside and said, yeah, you're my guy. You're my gal. And so he was still being used in the service of God. Being used in the service of God. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter what you look like. Whether you're black, white, brown, bad, purple. Doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. Doesn't matter if you got dark, rich, flowing locks or land a space shuttle lock. Doesn't matter. The opposite end of the stream, go back and read the book of Samuel. Samuel was just a boy when God started speaking to him in the temple. Just because you're young doesn't mean that God can't use you. Just because you're old doesn't mean that God can't use you. Doesn't mean it. God can use you wherever you're at. Barren, God will make you fruitful. Old, God will make you young if he has to. Just be willing to be used. Verse 11. And then an angel of the Lord appeared, standing to the right side of the altar of incense. So God sends a messenger down to the altar of incense. Now, the incense altar was representative of the prayers of the people. As the smoke would rise up from the incense, it, it, it was symbolic of the prayers of God's people rising up just outside the holy place of the holy ones, just outside the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, was kept, the prayers of the people would be going up. And so it represented the prayers of the people going up before the throne of God. How appropriate that God would send an angel to stand by the right side of, of, the right side of that altar. You see, when prayers go up, God sends answers down. Now, it may not always be the answers that we want to hear, but I can guarantee you this much. If you're praying, God's answering. Now, Zacharias is going to get an answer that he ain't expecting, and he may not have wanted to hear. And so let's watch this. The angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell on him. Here's something that we know about angels. They're awesome. They are terrifying. They carry with them the holiness of God. If these are angels from God's throne, they carry the aura of his holiness. If these are angels from another throne, they're terrifying and awesome for a different reason. Don't mess with angels. And so Zacharias was troubled. He was terrified. But watch this. I love this because whenever God talks, whenever God sends us, this is his message. But the angel said to him, Do not be. You know the greatest thing that keeps people away from you? It is fear. We are afraid to stand before God because we know that we are unworthy. 
And yet God, knowing that, gives us the message, do not be afraid. Why do people avoid God? Why do people try to dismiss God, try, try to say that God doesn't exist? Because if God exists, then we are responsible to him. And if we are responsible to him and we have fallen so very short of his glory that we are a dishonor to him, then guess what? We should be afraid of his wrath. And yet watch this. God says, not be afraid. In the garden, God said, Adam, where are you? It wasn't that God didn't know where Adam was. It's that God wanted Adam to figure out where he was. God says, do not be afraid. When we look at the cross and we see how the arms of Jesus stretched out, Upon the cross. That is God saying, Do not be afraid. You're taking care. So, verse 13. Wow. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. Your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you will name him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. I would many rejoice at John's birth. Well, first off, because his birth would be a miracle. His birth would be a miracle. That the baron has born. Son. And so there would be rejoicing. There will be rejoicing by Mary, whom we will meet in a few verses. Why? Because of the recognition that this is the forerunner of Christ. Watch this. Wow. And you will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Why? For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Imagine that. Imagine that you are a church family and you receive word that the child that is yet to be conceived is going to be used mightily of God. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. How great was he? Jesus said it like of those born to women, none was greater than John. And yet, the least will be greater. So up until the point of Jesus' death on the cross, up until the point of the birth of the church at Pentecost, there was no prophet or in Christ greater than his relative God. God himself in flesh put his imprint on the authenticity. Watch this. Ooh, this is good stuff. Verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And here's the conditions of his life. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. So he is going to be. These were the requirements of the Nazarite. You weren't allowed to drink wine, strong drink. You weren't supposed to eat honey because, of course, like ferment. You were to have no contact with dead bodies. Which is interesting because John, coming from a priestly household, the dead body thing was already baked into his lot in life. But John is going to be a Nazarite 
from the priestly household. And watch this. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, that we would all be like John, that we would all be filled with the Holy Spirit. And watch this. Even from his mother's womb, so even before he is born, before he would know right from wrong, the Holy Spirit would come upon him and would fill him. Oh, Father God, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit that we would be the embodiment of John, even as we are called to be the embodiment of your son, Jesus Christ. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Why? Because the religion had become so corrupt. The religion had become so empty that many had given up on it. Many had given up. And they had gone secular. Father God, we need the Spirit, that Holy Spirit, that we might turn many hearts to you. They will go also before him. Who's the him? Before the Messiah. In the Spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That was John's calling. That was John's purpose. And you know what? The Lord Jesus has come, died, been raised from the dead, and he's Guess what? Our purpose is our purpose be filled with the Holy Spirit. Our purpose is to turn the children of man to the Lord, their God. Our purpose is to go before Christ's second coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Why? to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Do you think we have a father-child problem today here in America? Yes, we do. Look at how many parents end up murdering their children, end up abusing their children. To the Do you think we have a father abandonment problem as a wedge of trying to live the modern life? has driven a wedge between the parents and the children? Oh, you betcha. And yet our calling as children of God, our calling with the name Christian, little Christ, is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Do you think there might be some injustice in the world? But you see, none of that's going to happen unless we are filled. None of that can happen unless we are willing to walk before in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Because you see, God isn't going to try to do it. God's a gentleman and a loving father. But God will will envy. And then it's up to us, God. If you've never followed Christ, it's up to you to decide. Follow Christ. If you've been a Christ follower, it's up to you to decide. Are you going to be filled with? And in either case, you got to ask God because God's not going to. And so as we close out today, I want to give you the opportunity to invite God to either 
adopt you as a child, never walked with him before, never knew him. Or if you once walked with him and you walked away, I'm going to invite you to come back because, you know, as I said earlier, his arms are wide open. And just as the angel said, not if you have been praying, God help me. Pray. Prayers. If you have been praying, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? I don't understand my life. God is. If you have walked with God, but you've been walking without power and you've been trying to do it in your own flesh, today is the day for you. Pray and ask God to fill you. And all it takes is a simple prayer. All it takes is a simple prayer and a simple confession. Doesn't have to be fancy. All you got to do Say is God, I was wrong. Take me in. Fill me up. Fill me with your spirit. Make me your child. Send me out on the mission. I will go. Thank you, Father, for your spirit. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. Father, for Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking the punishment that was due. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming in, taking up residence. You prayed that we would really love from you. And hearing from you, you can contact us in a variety of ways. A variety of ways are available to you. Oh my, I need to make an adjustment. Let me adjust. Editing on the fly. <laughs> on the screen, you will find the various ways that you can contact us. You can contact us by email. Staff at bounce-point.org. You can contact us by Facebook. Our Facebook page is balance.cc. You can message us through YouTube, at least until YouTube gets tired of conservatives and kicks us off. At Balance Point Church, that's our YouTube channel. You can snail mail us at Balance Point Church at 1998 East. Horace, O-R-I-S Street, Willowbrook, California, 90222. We look forward to hearing from you. And we desire to know what God is doing in your life through Balance Point. If you are in need. Well, actually, before we get to prayer, we invite you to come and visit our uh, ministry center located at www.bounce-point.org. There you will find resources to help you in your spiritual walk, spiritual gifts guide. You'll find the majority of our back catalog, at least parts that didn't get lost in various computer moves. Follow the teaching for Bounce Point Church, going all the way back to like 2000. Yeah, we've got audio and video going that far back. And you can reach it at balance-point.org. And, um, you know, we invite you to register just so we know who we're serving. Um, we don't sell your data or anything like that. We're not going to invade your home. I think maybe three times a year we actually get around to sending out an email Everybody's registered on our site. But we do invite you to register, to get to know us, let us get to know you. 
If you are in need of prayer, you can put a prayer request in at bound-point.org. There's actually a form there for you to do that. Or you can email us, and the email address for prayer is prayer at balance-point.org. We are a praying church, and we love to pray, and we live to pray. We live to intercede for those who are uh, in need. And with that, we are going to close with a word of I do look forward to next year. We have some good stuff that is coming down the pipe. And I can hardly wait for it because, oh, wow, it's going to be so good and it's going to serve so many people. But keep us in your prayer as we go forth to do the Lord's work. Uh, we do. We will have a couple of announcements even before the big one. And this is the, that's going to be kind of a big one, but we're going to save that for another time, probably after. Because uh, Bounce Point is going to be making some changes in the direction that we're going starting in 2020. So for that, you're going to have to stay tuned. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this time in your work. Thank you for the ability to share uh, what you have given to us. Father, we invite you into our lives this week. We ask that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us eyes to see the divine appointments you have planned for us. And we thank you, Father God, for all of these in the mighty name of your Son and our Savior. Amen.